All right, I think we're going to start. I got a little thumbs up. And I have 50 minutes to give you guys a lot of material. Okay, because I want, my goal is for you guys to leave here to say, okay, that's doable. I can do that. Okay. The, the way that I teach is I don't fish for you. I teach you to fish. So I really want to give you what you're looking at and what you're going to be addressing and then for you to use the tools you have and then realize maybe, oh, I'm going to learn a little bit more about this, but not something totally new. You have to follow my process and, you know, it's going to take you days to learn. Okay. So to begin with, um, my name is Eva. Think of evolution. That's the easiest way to pronounce it. Eva Clark. I'm in Santa Cruz. And to begin this gut-directed hypnosis for IBS, I think we need to first start with what is it, right? And what is it not? So to start, IBS is a functional disorder. It is not a disease, all right? It's dealing with what's actions that are happening in the gut not with some sort of disease. It is not life-threatening, nor is it physical damaging. And this will be an important component. It is not physically damaging to the gut, even though it might be extremely painful, ex a lot of sensations going on, a lot of bloating, a lot of constipation or diarrheas. It is not physically damaging. However, it is very similar to diseases that are life-threatening. So first and foremost, do not diagnose. And if a client comes in with issues saying, I think I've got IBS, have them go and find out because the symptoms mimic other issues that are much more threatening, such as cancers, celiac disease, Crohn's, and colitis. What is IBS? Irritable bowel syndrome. Irritable bowel syndrome is actually addressed by the exclusion of others. So if you've got issues and you go to your physician, what they're going to do is test for everything else that's threatening. If they don't have anything threatening, there isn't any inflammatory markers, and more or less you've got this criteria going on, they'll say, you got IBS. We don't need to get too much into this piece just because I have so much I want to uh, teach, but you will have it in your um, outline. But it really is issues of you'll have people that have a lot of pain, pain right after eating or pain all the time, and it usually goes away if they've gone to the restroom, right, passing stools. They have a lot of bloating issues, or they have a lot of constipation. It takes them forever. They'll be hours in the toilet, or diarrhea or urgency. So what's most important for you to know is when a client comes in with IBS, find out what is their experience, because that's what you're going to work with. All right? Are they needing to go all the time? And anytime they go out, they have to plan their outing to make sure where is all the bathrooms, because when I have to go, I have to go now. Right? Or I have to go very often. So if they have to go out for several hours, they go to the movies, they're going to be in the restroom twice. Or they're fine until all of a sudden they do have to go, and then there'll be hours on the toilet. And all these things produce shame, embarrassment, stress, depression, because a lot of people are limited with IBS. They can't go out. They're too afraid to go out. Oh, what if something happens? What if all of a sudden I get the runs? What if, you know, so a lot is going on that you're going to address when you work with a client with IBS. So the first thing you need to do when a client comes saying, oh, I was diagnosed with IBS, is you're actually going to educate them on it. Don't assume they know what it is because of this, for example. There was a survey in the UK that revealed that 21% of people diagnosed with IBS thought it would end up becoming a cancer. 40% colitis. That means you might get your colon removed, right? And 47% thought it's going to revert, it's going to get even worse. So you'll hear things going, oh my God, it's only going to get worse. 
right? Oh my gosh, this is only the start of something. So all this is going on in their heads. And that's one of the things you need to address. Because if you think that pain that keeps happening and keeps, you know, kicking you in the gut might become a cancer, that's really getting even the body is going to start freaking out as you freak out. So the first thing you need to educate them is to let them know, hey, you've got an IBS diagnosis, you're good to go. And that's because if you've got IBS, that means there's no physical damage happening in your body. Your doctor has tested for everything else. It's an exclusion diagnosis. Nothing else serious is going on. You're good to go. Now we just have to help regulate the bowels again. I want to tell them it's not life-threatening. Because if you've got something and you think it's life-threatening, how do you think your emotions are affecting your gut, right? You want to make sure they know it's not going to get worse. It doesn't have to get worse. It doesn't have to be forever. It's only function. My favorite word and what I always teach my clients to use is their gut is a little wonky right now, okay? It's nothing more than that. And a lot of people have it. They're not alone. They're thinking, oh my gosh, I have this and no one else has this and I'm probably the only one who has to find toilets, you know, and has to organize everything. And you know, why is every time I get nervous, I have to run to the bathroom? Well, I did this morning. Before presentation, I empty out my brawls properly quite a few times. <laughs> it happens to all of us. However, it doesn't happen for three whole months but that's what's been going on for them. It has become almost habitual. So what causes this? Now, when you go to your doctor, they're gonna say, there's no known cause, because there isn't a physical thing that's going on other than functional, so they can't find a cause because it's only an action, right? But if you look at the studies, this is what's in common. If you ask your clients, a lot of them will tell you, well, I had this terrible gut bug. I mean, I was letting go everywhere. I thought I would never end. And then from that moment, it never seemed to recuperate. Other times, very, not very common, a massive diet change, right? You Google, and all of a sudden you're like, ooh, I'm gonna do this liquid diet, and then you, you know. Your gut's not used to it, and you just knock it kind of out of whack again, right? You get it out of its normal motility. Stress, and I'll get more into this one, how this one affects the gut. But if they are prolonged stress, for example, today it's just one presentation. I emptied my bowels. But if I have presentation every day, and I'm in my head thinking, I don't know how to do this, or whatever else, and I'm having to empty my bowels, I might start having some issues. You know, the bowel is going to start adapting a certain way of being. And every time I leave the house, I might have to go to the restroom first. And then it just becomes totally habitual. There's also studies showing that emotional triggers, bereavement, grief, were happening when the IBS began. So find out about those things. You'll get older, you'll get adults, and you'll get a lot of kids. A lot of kids have IBS. Anybody here had stomach issues when they were kids? I had so many stomach aches. They thought, you know, at first I must have had appendicitis. But no, I was going to a new school. It was a private school. And it had nothing to do with my public school. And I freaked. And my gut freaked. And then there is, it is in common in families. But the, the, the studies show that it's, not so much genetic, it's more of a habit. So if your mother's had IBS issues, she's gonna hone in more on, oh baby, does your stomach hurt? Oh, did that, how is it doing now? You know, in my own family, we had a little security blanket that was the security blanket for tummy issues. So that's going to have your clients hone in more on what's happening in the gut. And you know what happens when you pay attention to something, right? <clears throat> It's almost like the pain thing. Talk about comfort, don't talk about pain, because if you talk about pain, what are you gonna notice? You talk about your gut, your whole childhood, your mom talks about your belly. Oh, look at that belly, it's all swollen. You're like, eh? Oh, my belly's swollen, 
and then you're always looking at my belly swollen. So these are the probable causes. But these are the initiating causes. What actually creates additional exacerbations, further sensitivity and hypervigilant, is stressing about it. Because when you stress about it, you trigger further symptoms because if you're stressing, your gut is tense. If it's tense, there's no way you're gonna digest properly. And so things are gonna stay, shift, shoot, all sorts of things are happening. If you're stressing about it, where's your attention? What was that? Oh my jet, oh my, you know. Creating further hypervigilance. Think about it, if I were blind, not something I want to do right now, but if I were blind, what would happen to the sensitivity of my fingers? Increase. It would increase, right? Because what am I focusing on? You're focusing on feeling. You're having to really learn and hone in something. So if you're constantly focusing on the gut, you will actually develop more neural pathways and more sensitivity to every single nerve that is attached to this area. My clients can totally tell how, you know, where the food is at any location, right? Because they've developed that sensitivity. And then, and this one I love, and I, and I work not just with IBS, colitis will happen like this. Um, all of a sudden they feel something, they freak out. Their freak out are emotions. Those emotions are being distributed through the body through neuropeptides. So their gut all of a sudden receives that freak out and then the gut's like, <gasps> what's that? And then the gut freaks out and then you know the person's like, oh, it's even worse. And then they freak out and then their gut freaks out and then it's a cycle creating further symptoms. And then what happens is, you know, we have amazing Google. And so the minute we have some issue, we start doing these roller coaster diets. And I have clients that are like, well, I tried this and then that didn't work. So then I tried this. So then I just went on this total, you know, no food fad for so many days. And then I did, and I, and I always tell them, how long did you do each one of these? Well, I tried it for three days and nothing happened. So you're, you're dealing with something organic, you know, if you, it's like I always tell them, if you have a plant that has yellow leaves and you want to help the plant get healthy again, are you going to try a new treatment, you know, with whatever, meant, whatever you're going to put into that plant, organic stuff, and think after three days, oh no, the plant's still yellow, I got to try another treatment. And they're like, well, no, it's going to take time. This is organic too. So if you're going to use a treatment, you're going to have to give it plenty of time for the body to adapt to it and to respond to it. So you've got your clients doing way too much and that's going to knock it out even further. Because the gut's like, wasn't there food at some point? You know, and it's no longer what it's used to anymore. So that will knock it out further. So your clients are going to come with, well, does that mean I'm, I'm, I'm causing IBS, you know? And this is what I always explain to them. These are my little gingerbread men. I, I draw them for pretty much all my clients. So I say, okay, this is you. So I said, when you're in number one, sympathetic state, and I go, it's not that there's a cyber tooth tiger that's the extreme sympathetic. When you're in, oh my gosh, I've only got 15 minutes to take a shower and get out of here, and then I die, and then you're grabbing your food, and you're running out the door, and you're eating when you're in the car, and then you're like, oh, traffic, shit, ah, ah, and then you're getting to then you have these to-do lists, and then you have to do, and then the meeting went too long, and so you only have 10 minutes for lunch, and then you have to, excuse me, your body's in sympathetic, all right? And when your body's in sympathetic, your body's saying, she's on the move, she's going, she's doing stuff, she, he. So the body allocates all the energy to your extremities, to your arms, to your legs, and to your frontal lobe, which is saying, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. It's only repeating what you already know, which is why when you're stressed, you don't remember anything, and you pretty much can't figure out a new way of doing anything. You're like, I don't know, I don't know. What, what are we gonna do? I don't know, let me think about it. Because you can't. 
So when that happens, is there any energy in the gut? No. Digestion, digestion takes a lot of energy. And if, at the, you know, in the morning, you go and you grab your toast and your coffee and you run out the door, you will not digest. There's no energy for it. So then my, most of my clients are like, oh, that makes sense. Now, if you're in parasympathetic, if you're relaxed, if you've got time to eat, not just the eat, but actually time to digest. Has anybody ever had their mom, I don't know if it's typical here, but my mom used to always say, don't go into the pool at least until half an hour after eating. This is why, because moms knew that the bodies need to digest. You need to be relaxed. You can't be playing. Playing is sympathetic. It might be fun, but the body's in sympathetic. It doesn't need to be stressed. So you need to give the body proper time to digest the food. It's also the moment when your body can restore the skin and the gut and you know do all its repairs so that you can get better. <coughs> They're also going to ask about, well, and this happens a lot, if they've come to you, they've tried everything else. Because if they come to you, they have to admit it's all in their heads. And they don't want to. I've had a client, she was actually 16, and she confessed, she goes, well, Eva, if this works, then I have to admit it was all in my head. And so you don't want them thinking that. So I always explain to them, going, well, Stress might be a factor, the emotional triggers might be a factor. I go, but by the time you've had this for three whole months, all these issues, it is physical. Which is why one session is not gonna heal it, okay? It is physical. By the time it's been doing that for so long, your motility is deregulated. It's no longer moving properly, or it's spurting, or it's frozen, or it's tightened. So you are feeling physical symptoms, and they're like, oh, it's not in their heads. They have an exaggerated gastrocolic reflex, which means a lot of times they eat, the minute they eat, they have to rush to the bathroom. Have you ever heard of anyone say, oh man, when I eat potatoes, it goes right through me. It's not really going right through me, but it triggers the response of the colon releasing whatever's in it which is probably the meal before. And then I also explained to them is by the, because of all these issues, you have developed you know, more sensitive nerve endings in this whole area. So we're going to need to soften that up a bit so that your seven bits of information in every moment, one of them is not dedicated to what's going on in the gut. And I always tell them, trust me, if there's an issue, your body's going to let you know. If you don't get that first inkling, it's going to give you a little slap. And if you don't get that slap, it's really going to knock you over. So trust me, those little things are fine. And fortunately for us, we don't have to prove it. It's been researched. It's probably the, I think it is, it is the most researched use of hypnosis more than 30 years of research to the point that it's not just case studies published somewhere these are randomized control trials just half of the studies that were published in scientific journals were RCTs these studies were uh, sponsored by uh, gastroenterologists, psychologists so the proof is there what's interesting is that it's actually most effective in the worst cases. So you can go to your doctor and say, hey, when everything else doesn't work, our stuff works in the worst of cases. They're like, oh, good. So how much time do you have, you know? Because you will be able to show this to doctors. I actually, what I do in my area, and I would definitely recommend if you want to work with this, is there's now all over the place functional medicine forums so these are doctors that realize that chronic issues have taken time to create and they're gonna take time to heal and that reducing or re eliminating a symptom is not taking care of the issue. And they realize that there's biological factors and psychosocial factors and what you're going to address 
as all three, but mainly for them, you're going to address those psychosocial factors. So these are the, uh, the two main uh, researchers of uh, all those studies that have proven that uh, they, it's called gut-directed hypnosis works, is two main researchers. A gastroenterologist, Warwell, in the UK. He's the one who began to publish in the scientific journals, and he's still going on. He still has a clinic. Um, he provides seven to 12 sessions. This is all in your outline, too. And in his sessions, he always educates the clients because they're freaking themselves out. He wants them to know what it is. He wants them to know how the body digests. He teaches them relaxation. He teaches them, he does visualizations, metaphoric visualizations, and we'll go into detail to this. Direct suggestions to help the body heal. He teaches warm glove anesthesia, uh, sorry, technique. And what this is is, when someone with IBS, they can have a really tight gut. And so he's really teaching them how to, it's almost like who here has learned that uh, using your hand like an, an ice, you know, for it to be numb? It's very similar, but instead of the, ice get, the hand getting numb, the hand gets warm. And then you apply that. You know, it's like that nice security blanket you had as a kid. And that helps the gut to, oh, I'm safe. And then he has them always doing daily hypnosis because this has become physical. So you are directing the body over and over to change physical things that are going on, right? These actions, these motilities. Then we have Paulson. Paulson's a psychologist and he created the North Carolina Protocol. And what he wanted to do is he said, I want to make it even simpler that any health practitioner, any health professional that has a weekend course of hypnosis can just read my scripts. And he was actually pretty effective. If you read it as hypnotherapists and hypnotists, you'll be like, oh my God. But this has actually worked. I know that we can make it work even better. And this has proven to be 80% effective, these protocols. To the point that in the UK, unfortunately not here yet, but in the UK, the health guidelines, there's a um, institute called the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence. They have guidelines that is followed. It is, a, it is not governmental and it is not pharmacological institute. And they actually recommend hypnotherapy wow. when <clears throat> other treatments have not worked to the point that they actually open, and in your outlines you'll have a re reference to a case study of Helen Brimner. She was a nurse practitioner, and she was given the task to open the first clinic of gut-directed hypnosis in the UK, national clinic. So there are three key areas, well, even before I continue, because I'm like blasting through this, we have time. They're pouring it into the areas, our own protocol, more specific and more catered to our knowledge. Is there any questions? I kind of went through this whole, what is IBS quickly. Yeah. Um, when you say the patient comes in from a doctor, do you need to have the background on a colonoscopy to, to rule out any kind of they need to have it. Their doctor will have done a blood test to see if there's any inflammation. Blood test or a colonoscopy? If the first blood test detects something going on, then they'll do a colonoscopy. Or if the patient is, then they'll do a colonoscopy. But it's not necessary as a first step. In the UK, for example, general practitioners, um, G, uh, doctors can do these tests unless there's inflammatory markers indicating they don't need to go further. What we want to make sure is their doctor said, you have IBS. You can work with colitis and Crohn's, and I actually teach a class on using hypnotherapy and NLP for all chronic diseases, but when you work with something that is life-threatening, you're going to work along with. You're going to make sure they're getting their their work and their doctors are following what's going on and testing inflammation, but you can do a lot. You can really lower all that down. 
I, a lot, even with functional medicine, I did a presentation, and you can see it on YouTube if you want to kind of grab stuff to do a presentation to your local doctors. And some of their clients they sent me were IBS, but a lot were colitis because there's a lot of stress factors that really influences what's happening. Any other questions before we continue? Yeah? What I do is when I have a client, I always ask them can, you know, to, for a list of what they're taking so that we can detect if there's any. So, yes, okay, repeating the question. Yes, um, if someone's at coming and maybe they have antidepressants or they're using something that might also affect their bodies, I always ask for a list of what they're taking and I will check what is the uh, secondary effects to make sure. And I'll just have them speak to their doctor about that. But I do, I, whatever they're taking, it's between them and their doctors. If what we're doing, we're working for a while and there isn't big changes. I worked, for example, with essential trimmers. And in essential trimmers, she was taking an extremely powerful antidepressant. And one of the secondary effects was trimmers. And we worked for quite a while and there wasn't a modification. So she took time off and she's still finishing that to spend a year to slowly wean herself off the antidepressants before we continue. Because it, it was like, okay, I think there's something else happening too. So you, in your intakes, so yes. you're asking for prescription Yes. Uh, the question was, do I have a list of what creates what? I do know if they're taking pain medications. Most likely that's also causing constipation. So if we work with pain first and really reduce that so that they can start weaning off with their doctors, then a lot of times that resolves itself. A lot of times that resolves itself. Yeah? How about any relationship, particular type of food? Many people says, oh, the meal may always but it sounds like it's not just meal, because when you start listening to their story, it's like everything. Yeah, so do particular foods do this? They can. However, when you start working through this, they will have less sensitivities to food. I always give this, um, when someone comes in with a lot of, oh, I'll give you an example, celiac disease, which is something like, oh, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so I had a, he was a 19-year-old. And fortunately, he had just been diagnosed only like six months before. So I was like, yes, he's going to remember what happened, you know, before it started. And so I, you know, I questioned him, okay, what's going on in your life six months, nine months ago, you know? And he's like, because oh, I started college. And my parents decided that I had to wake up on my own. I was responsible for my alarm clock and waking up and getting dressed and getting my breakfast and getting to class on time because I was an adult. And he goes, and so I had my new truck, you know, and I had to get to Cabrillo College on time every day. And I said, so how was that? He goes, he goes, I would wake up. I was almost always late. I had to hurry up. I rushed out of the house. I would pass by a bagelery, buy a bagel, and eat it on my way to class. So think of it this way, the body is stressed and it's going, what is creating this high, high level of stress? It doesn't know. All it knows is every day when I am extremely stressed, a bagel is in my gut. <laughs> so I'm going to get this kid away from that. What do I do? Reject the bagel. And I've had this a lot with allergies. Food allergies. The, you know, he's like, the gluten yeah, but it even happened with celiac. I was like, wow, I thought it was. Celiac disease. Yeah. And I will also have clients, I work a lot, my specialty is multiple sclerosis, and there's a lot of food intolerances. And when we start just, you know, looking at this, you get these clicks. They're like, oh. 
Uh, one, um, one client, every time she's stressed, she goes to her comfort food. What is her comfort food? Tomato sauce, you know, it's like chips and tomato salsas. What does her body finally reject? Tomatoes. Because the body's trying to get away from the stress. It doesn't know it's not that, you know. So, actually, even in the research study of Helen Brumner, I think she indicates that what happens is once you start reducing the IBS and teaching them relaxation responses and getting them under con their stress factors under control, that most, if not all, the food intolerances go away. Most, if not all, food intolerances go away. A food is not viral. Your immune system has marked a food as something threatening. <coughs> Your body might not like it and it will get rid of it if it doesn't want to consume it, but it doesn't need to be attacked. <coughs> but it has decided it's dangerous enough to attack it. And so you're going to walk the body out of those. You know, it's, it's the Pavlov's law, right? You eat, you ring a bell, you eat, you ring a bell, you start ringing a bell, body salivates. You eat, you're stressed, you eat, you're stressed. It's the same condition response. So, what we're going to do when we have a client with IBS is we're going to work on three key areas. We're going to alter symptoms, because remember it's physical now. Motility and all the rest, and we'll go in detail on each one. We're going to teach them relaxation response, because they're in that parasympathetic all the time. You know, just the fact of slowing down their, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I'm late, is going to help their gut. And we're going to address any emotions or triggers. So the first one, the direct suggestions, right, the, for altering symptoms. These are some of the things that you can do with your clients. Get them into trance and do direct, I mean direct suggestions of the food goes into the body. The minute you swallow, the whole gastrointestinal tract is one long muscle, kind of like a snake, you know. And the minute the food goes in, these muscles just go tense, relax, tense, relax, tense, relax. Slowly through the gut. Remember they're having these spastic, you know, all sorts of stuff. So you're having them visualize how food just goes through nice and easy and the body takes the nutrients it wants until it goes into the colon and the colon the body extracts the water so it just has the right consistency and that you don't need to go anytime you know the rectum is full you go when the rectum is really full not just when something's been deposited so you're really helping with those rushing to the bathroom and you know the colic response then you can also do but metaphors and in your outline I uh, put one of the metaphors which I love it's just a ri river metaphor but you can do metaphors like imagine this muscle is like a hose like a garden hose and maybe it's got kinks you know and so have them imagine that they're unkinking that hose and they're just feeling that water just flowing steadily through or if they've got diarrhea that hose has been turned on way too high you know and so you just Turning it down, turning it down, just got that right pace. All these things are visualizations to help the body. With kids, caterpillars, right? Caterpillars going too fast, going too fast, going too fast. We gotta slow that caterpillar down. Whoa, easy, you're not a horse, right? Or if it's, they have a lot of issues of constipation, we're gonna get that caterpillar going. And then the, the river, and you have that on the outline. I love this one, I use it not just for IBS in which what you're doing is associating in the subconscious a river to their gut. You can do the same thing for pain. Has anybody ever done uh, object modification for pain in hypnosis? So you have them visualize what does the pain represent? Oh, it's this big square thing that's, you know, puncturing my... Okay, and then you have, the, have this subconscious, okay, that whatever that is, that triangle is your pain, the pain is the triangle, the subconscious doesn't know any different now that the, this element, and then you have them slowly in trance visualize modifying that into something fluffy and soft and round and 
and it's helping with pain. And then with the motility, they, and you have them envision this river that's turbulent. And I don't know if you, and who here is in California, but lately, if you go to the beach, it's full of debris. And it's, you know, so you have them envision this river. It's got debris on the sides. It's all turbulent. It's black. It's dark. It's cold. And then you have them slowly modify that river. The sun starts coming out. And, you know, the river starts getting more smooth on the surface and then deeper down and the debris is gently carried away and the grass starts blooming. And again, this is that modification to calm everything down. So, yeah. so you're visualizing this is how your stomach is working, like a river. So in, yeah, so you would have like, your, you're imagining this river so I'm, if I'm visualizing that the stomach is a river, yes, you will indicate at the beginning, your gut is like this river, visualize this river. And knowing that your subconscious knows that this river isn't your gut, but it's a representation of your gut. And then you continue to pace it and then just start modifying the river. And then at the end, you can even repeat going in any time you think of this beautiful meandering river and this relaxing scene you will feel that comfort and again just pace 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 then you want to really work on the relaxation response and I think that is one of the things hypnosis is very strong so I'll have clients come in and they're like all I was told is I have to learn to breathe you know that's not enough when you're freaking out, I can breathe all you want. I'm still going to have stuff going on. So first thing, as we said already, tell them what it is. What is IBS? It's not physically damaging. You don't have to, i got to fix this now, I'm going to fix this now, because if not, I'm going to make it worse, and it's going to end up being a cancer. No, you can have IBS for 40 years. It's fine. But we're going to make that much shorter than that. You want to reframe. Watch what they say, right? Oh, this is only going to get worse. Well, this is my fault. Well, I'm going to make it worse. Or issues of hate, right? Oh, my, my body's punishing me. Let's work on that. There needs to be a friendly environment here. Any ego strengthening scripts you have, those are great. A lot of what's happening is, especially with any kind of chronic, is your clients have lost trust, lost trust in their bodies, and they feel out of control. So you want to work on that. And I'll talk a little bit more about one of the ways that I, I work on regaining trust. That warm hand technique. Have them imagine their hand. What happens if you put your hand here what, at, for a while? What happens when you cross your legs? What happens in that space? It's warm. It gets warm. So they're doing this in hypnosis and you're telling them, oh, just with the power of your mind, you're making your belly warm. And they're like, I am. And you can do this in any moment whenever you need. And so you're anchoring that in. There's a great one I love, which is get them into a deep, deep, deep relaxation, <coughs> like quadruple induction. They are out, they are like in la la land, they're in the perfect place. You're telling them this is perfect for you, this is everything, just enjoying. Everything is you know, happening and sorted just love how you love it and they're just in this bliss. And you say, all right, now bring your thumb and finger together and rub it and know that you can capture all of this in any moment of your day just by bringing your finger and your thumb together. And that way when they get out of trance and you say, oh, do that for a moment, and they're like, ooh. I've had a client with colitis come in, she, she, she did this instead. And she's like, can I outdo this? Because this really works. No. Once you've got that anchored in, you have this. I had a client, uh, he's a big CEO of a pharma company actually, and he says when he's got the salespeople coming in and the meetings and they're just at him, he just has his hand in his pocket, he's got a little ring going on, and he's like, my secretary is saying, how are you so composed 
with all this negativity. It's not important. And he's got that. So that's a great tool to anchor. All right, and the third area is address those underlying emotions, the stressors, the triggers. There's actually studies that show that I, people diagnosed with IBS are four times as likely to have sexual abuse, to have had sexual abuse. There's shame. There's shame about what's going on. There's guilt, there's conflicts. Check all those things, right? Also work on the secondary <coughs> gains of having IBS. Who here has not used a migraine as an excuse to get out of something? <laughs> or a headache, or oh, I think I'm coming down with something. I better stay home. Yeah, IBS has become their way to say no, politely. Right? So you want to give them skills to be able to say no without using their body as an excuse. It's also a way to get in sympathy, right? I can only use that warm blanket as a kid when I had a bellyache. And then you want to find out, and the best way, the best way is to ask directly. Ask the body, what is this IBS about? And I do this with all diseases. It's similar to regression therapy, but instead of regressing to a cause, because there's a cause of a cause of a cause of a cause of a cause, you can get to the Big Bang. But if you actually, in hypnosis, get them into this wonderful space that feels safe to them, it's the beach, it's their childhood bedroom, it's wherever it is, and you ask their subconscious to bring in a representation of their IBS. I do this a lot with particular symptoms, a representation of their constipation, a representation of their colic spas you know, colic spasms in their colon. You can ask directly to the subconscious, to that representation, how do you serve? What do you need more of? What do you need less of? When did you come in? What does this person need to learn? And you can get from the IBS in trance all, all this, the stress factors, all the psychological beliefs, decisions, and triggers. So the body will talk about, you know, they're constantly putting themselves third or fourth. They never put themselves first because they're constantly needing to help people without considering themselves. They'll say things about they won't ask for help. They feel they're not allowed to ask for help. It would be a weakness, so I'm not being able to say no, IBS is a great way to do that, right? It's always uh, having an allergy to smoke, right? I can say, no, you can't smoke in my house because I got an allergy. How convenient. Um, a lot of fears of failure. I've got to do it perfect. If I fail, oh my gosh, people are not going to think I have any worth. Mm, the body freaks out, right? Or you're having issues at work, you think you're gonna be fired, and it's not like, oh, bummer, I have to find another job. It's more like, oh my gosh, if I get fired, this is the end of the world. No one will, will employ me because they'll know I've been fired and I'm just not worth it. All that is happening. And in trance, you can find out. And not just with IBS, you can find out with any symptom. Any questions? If not, I have some examples of things that, um, that the gut will talk about in trance. Would you be interested in that? Sure. Okay. Let's see. I have one question. Yes. Have you ever worked with someone who had IBS, but it turned into something else, and then you were able to bring them back from a more severe... Okay, so the question is, if I've worked with someone with IBS, and then it got into something worse, yes and no. IBS and migraines are usually like the first, the, the body is saying, hey, this isn't a way of living. You're putting way too much pressure on me. 
and on yourself. If the client ignores that, the body can go to something else. It's not that the IBS develops into something else. So my specialty is multiple sclerosis. And in multiple sclerosis, the majority of my clients had migraines or IBS as kids. Those didn't develop into multiple sclerosis because it's another area. But that was the first marker when the body is saying, hey, pay attention, not, not okay. Think of disease like if a client comes with a relationship issue, is it really the relationship the issue? Or do you gotta go under and find out what's the beliefs, the codependencies, da da da. Disease is nothing more, nothing less. It's just life giving you a, hey, you need to address this. And if you don't address this, more things will happen. It doesn't develop into something. So, can you see that? Yeah. So in one case, my, this was a client who had constipation. And when we went in to talk to her uh, constipation, I'll be really quick, I'll just do one. Um, it was a bird, it was a bird and it was tethered. And so the bird is telling her that it's a reminder, this constipation, that you are tethered, you're holding yourself back, right? It said, it's all in your head, this holding yourself back. And it says, you need to learn to let go. So that's telling me, ooh, I gotta do some sessions on that. It's saying, you know, there's a bigger view from above, so I need to teach them about not getting so narrowed, but actually step back and look at the bigger picture of going, what's going on. It told her, these are verbatim the words that came in the session. It said, no, you don't have to be the only one in control. There is everyone else around you too. So there might be things about, I can't ask for help, I have to do it all myself, I have to control it all. This is an accountant, right? So, hmm, there's things for us to work on. And it's talking about allow things rather than force them. So then you're starting to have, for that third key, issues to work on. And as you work on these, that stress, all that's going on in the body, gets lowered. This is also in the outline, the same as the other ones, it's six to 10 sessions. I usually do it two weeks apart because you are working on the physical, so you wanna give them time for things to start taking effect. And in the sessions, I teach them a tool for the stress, or I work on those underlining emotional issues and always have them take home a recording so that they continue to redirect what's happening in the gut. I only assess the first time, the sixth, and if we continue, you know, to however many more, so that they're not focused on the symptoms. Do you charge per session? Or the whole thing? Um, charge per session. Yeah, that, I'll, I'll give packages. How much is it usually? For packages? Yeah. I charge 129 per session, which probably isn't, isn't very much in most places. I'm in Santa Cruz, California. But the people I work with are all with chronic issues, so they're, you know, they're already strapped, so I make it accessible. And if they are totally with not being able to work, then I also offer them discounts. Thank you. People work with me for quite a while. So with IBS, you're going to look at three to five months every other week. Um, if anyone wants to do a full training and really know how to work with any kind of chronic disease and really talk to the disease and figure out the symptoms, there's a, a training on my website and until the end of this month it's 50%. Right? Yes. How much is the training? What is uh, I think at 50% off, it's like $347.50 or something. Yeah. And this is teaching you how to use your tools to work with chronic disease. Do we have you or is it online? It's online, it's video <coughs> recorded. Yeah, so you can face yourselves and then there's a Facebook page and email for mentoring for any of the questions or anything you have in the training. And the decisions they made. Do you do distance work on them and with MS? Oh yes, half of my clients are not in my area. All right, so I have to close down, thank you. Any questions? Just I'm happy.